Welcome to Carbon Talks. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we had quite a, quite a big uptake in, in signing up for seats and also for um, the webcast. So uh, hopefully people will continue to trickle in. So if you can point out some empty seats as they come in, that would be great. Um, we have the great pleasure of hearing from Detlef Gerz, who's a sustainability manager at the city of Osnabrück in, uh, in Germany. And he's going to talk to us about effective climate leadership in cities, some lessons from Germany. Um, before we start, I, uh, it's our tradition to recognize that we're on unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And um, we'd also like to recognize our funders, the North Growth Foundation, uh, who keep our lights on at Carbon Talks, and uh, SFU Centre for Dialogue, who actually gives us somewhere um, to, to be. <laughs> and uh, the reason that we can, we can live cast this today is because of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. So thank you for being here today, Nishtenka. Um, on that note, for the first time, we're testing out live casting through YouTube. So uh, we're live online now, Detlef, so... <laughs> There's no cutting any accidents out. <laughs> um, we just, Carbon Talks, for those of you who've never been here, this is, uh, we tend to keep the presentations quite short. This is about having a conversation and, uh, and we're welcoming your questions. Uh, Kian, I see him back in the back corner there. If you're too shy to put up your hand, he's on Twitter and, um, and anyone watching online can um, tweet questions to at Carbon Talks. And we're using the hashtag RE Cities, um, a bit of a nod to our sister program, Renewable Cities, um, which is in pursuit of 100% renewable energy in, um, in cities around the world. Just going through all my ticks here, what else I have to talk about? Um, as I mentioned, Detlef is the head of sustainability for the uh, city of Osnabrück, Germany. Um, he's been with the city, uh, I think, since the Germ Germany first proposed uh, its, its climate action master plan and um, has quite intimate knowledge of the city's, city's actions. We just spent two jam-packed hours uh, speaking with him and some local city leaders uh, discussing all those points, so quite excited to share these with you. Um, Detlef's here because of um, Dr. Mishka Lysak, who's sitting here in the front row. He's actually a professor out of the University of Calgary and um, went through all the labor of applying for a SHRC grant and is, is sharing the, uh, the winnings of that SHRC grant by bringing um, Detlef here to, to find some mutual learnings between Canada and Germany. So thank you, Mishka. We're, we're really happy that you, that you brought him to us. But not only that, we have some visitors from the German um, Consul General. Um, uh, I, I actually can speak German, so I'm going to do this, but the, there's some words in here I'm not quite familiar with. But Herr Consul General Beck, es ist uns eine Ehre, Sie und Herrn Gerz und Herrn Resnick uh, zu SFU Carbon Talks begrüßen zu dürfen. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can do it from here. I think everybody can understand me. Well, I would like to, to thank the organizers from Simon Fraser University to give me this opportunity to be part of this uh, event, Effective Climate Leadership Lessons from Germany. I understand this is an event which is part of your monthly carbon talks organi organized by, by Simon Fraser. I know time is of the essence. Uh, you have come here to hear from Detlef Gertz about uh, the experience and, and the approach of the city of Osnabrück, and I'm sure you want to have enough time to ask questions and uh, to uh, exchange um, experiences. But I would just like to make two remarks. Uh, one is, uh, I would like to point out that uh, Detlef Gertz's uh, visit is organized in cooperation with the German Embassy in, in Ottawa and financed by Canadian federal money. I think it gains also special importance since there are on the Canadian side today four cities represented, if I'm uh, right, with Vancouver, North Vancouver, Surrey, and uh, also Saanich. And I would also like to, to point <coughs> out uh, to the fact that this event is just one more example of an ever-intensifying uh, cooperation between Germany and Canada on climate change, on what many consider as maybe the most important global challenge uh, we are facing today. As I think we are here in a meeting of experts, you all are very well aware of the crucial roles cities have to play. 
Also, cities all only cover about 2% of the service of the Earth. Cities consume about 78% of the energy, and according to World Bank numbers, city uh, contribute about 80% of carbon di dioxide uh, emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions. So this makes it clear how crucial the role is cities have to play in uh, contributing uh, to the fight against uh, climate change. And that makes me very curious, and I'm very much looking forward to hear about the experience of the city of Osnabrück, but also maybe of the representatives of the Canadian cities here. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. It's a pleasure that you're here. Detlef, please. So it's my turn. Yeah. I have to look at, the, at my wristwatch because uh, I wanted to give you a really uh, a presentation about what we are doing, but then the organizers uh, cut me down from 10 minutes to 5 minutes, so it will be a little difficult to give a a uh, real overview. Um, but I try. And everything I don't tell you now, you can ask afterwards in the discussion, and I have a lot of slides I might show you then. So um, I'm working for the city of Osnabrück, which is uh, in the northern part of Germany, and it has 165,000 inhabitants on a 120 square kilometer area. It's the third biggest uh, city in the state of Lower Saxony, which is uh, close to the North Sea. Uh, we have about 22,000 students in two universities in our city. And what is important for our energy consumption, we have two big companies who produce paper. We have a big copper production plant in our city. And uh, cars are produced in uh, Osnabrück, Volkswagen, and Porsche. When I always say that, the one thing is a rich city, and the others laugh because it's Volkswagen. And this is a problem, actually, not only for Volkswagen, because Volkswagen now wants his taxes back because they lost so much money. So this is one of the problems we're just facing. Well. Osnabrück's story in uh, climate change started already in 1992, as most cities in Germany, after the Rio conference then, when this uh, goal took up uh, for climate change. And from the beginning, uh, I, was, uh, um, I was employed there in Osnabrück as the head of the Department for Environment and Climate Protection. And we had one engineer from the beginning, since 1992, who is just responsible for climate change issues. And for 20 years, we asked for more stuff to make more projects, but that didn't work. And so, but last five years, there was a real um, uh, uprise in, in activities throughout Germany, caused by the EU, but caused by all these uh, things you know until now about climate change. So today we have five trained and educated staff, and with that we can move a lot and uh, can do a lot of projects. So we are looking back on 25 years of experience, and um, um, as I said, I can give you a very, very short uh, impression on that. One of the experiences we, we made is that if we reach the, want to reach the goal of the EU, the German government, the state government, and also our municipal government, which means 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 by 2050, and 50% more energy efficiency till then. That means we have to work very intensively together with the hinterland, with the surrounding counties, because a city like this with an energy mix uh, we have in Germany, which is very different from the one you have here in uh, British Columbia. Um, there we need uh, the surrounding counties, for example, to erect wind farms, which is not possible in a, in a city or at the edge of the city. So there's an intensive cooperation between the city and its hinterland. What did we achieve since uh, 1992? Well. Um, with the energy consumption all over, with industry, with traffic, with everything, dropped from this time to today by 14 percent. 
and the carbon dioxide emissions for that same amount uh, dropped e even by 24%. That was mostly reached by industry and commerce because as hi the higher the prices for oil and gas for energy got, the more, if it, the more profitable was it for industry to invest in, in techniques uh, to save energy and to save costs. So um, the uh, and the minima, so the the energy price, the output of carbon dioxide went down by 32 percent in industry. Also, households, uh, although they got grow bigger and bigger, the space everybody needs, and uh, people have more and more electrical things they use. Uh, still, there is because of more efficiency and better insulation. There's a drop of um, more than 22% in carbon dioxide emissions. The only problem, uh, the only problem, but one of the major problems we see and we have to reach our goals till 2050 is traffic, because traffic uh, emissions are almost constant since 1990, because cars got bigger, they have more uh, electric devices there that need uh, energy. So this is one of the reasons for a municipality it's quite difficult. That's why we go uh, into electric mobility. We will install uh, public transport completely electric from diesel now within the city till 2020. Uh, many other cities uh, follow the same goal. And uh, we try to um, create now a new a uh, plan for bicycle lanes through the whole city uh, and the, go the goal is till 2025 to um, rise the uh, modal split uh, from 20% bicycle traffic to 30% then. Uh, in renewables, uh, the chance we have in, in Osnabrück is uh, photovoltaics. That works because we have energy prices uh, in the, uh, are much, much higher than you have here. So we, we pay, even for the transition process, we pay more than you pay for the whole uh, uh, kilowatt hour here in British Columbia. Yeah, so it's uh, 28 uh, euro cents, which is about 35 Canadian cents. Uh, we pay in Germany for a kilowatt hour of uh, electricity. People think it's almost normal. Of course, they always complain. I think they also complain here if prices are going up one cent. Uh, but uh, with this framework, uh, a lot of uh, alternative or renewable energy is possibly possible to be paid. So um, the biggest problems we face in Germany at the present moment are transmission lines. Uh, we uh, have the situation that we have about 35,000 wind turbines uh, installed in Germany, most of them in northern Germany and more and more uh, offshore. And this uh, uh, renewable energy has to be transported to the consumers in west and south Germany. And uh, the energy system was totally different before, so we need enforcement and new lines. And there's a lot of protest of the people who are in favor of energy transition, but they don't want to have the power lines just in front of their garden, not in my backyard. The same thing with wind farms. So uh, seeking for acceptance for all kinds of processes and measures in this process of energy transition is something we had to learn is a very, very uh, crucial thing we have to look at. Um, Another prerequisite, um, you need to be successful in, that's what I learned, that you call it here in the German word, like kindergarten. So <laughs> it's the energy transition process uh, is that you need a general acceptance uh, by politicians on all levels of administration. It starts with the EU and the federal government and the state government, even the municipal government. And that holds since about 20 years. So there's a lot of discussion in detail to go this way or this way to the goal, but the goal is kept. No matter who is uh, governing uh, Germany, they always kept on this goal until now. And I, it all looks as if they serious do that in the future too. 
And this allows to be, have long-term commitments and frameworks that allow those in investments in renewables. So for example, last year in Germany, 15 or 20 billion uh, Canadian uh, dollars were invested in new renewables throughout Germany. So just to give you an impression about the huge sums. This, manner, this man, money is there. Uh, pension funds and insurance companies, they invest in that because there is a, um, a payback. Uh, they profit from that and they are sure that their investments are not lost by the next election. So that's why it works. So um, I think the five minutes are almost over, right? Yeah. Um, so. Framework is one thing, you have to have a financing system, either a carbon tax system, which uh, slowly but constantly grows, so you get an income to finance all these programs, or you need uh, uh, something like a working emission trade system. We have in Europe, although it's not very good working, but that's another five minutes I would need for that. <laughs> so. Um, what, what I said already, what is very important to get people engaged because um, energy transition process is a very, very complex thing. Nobody, when we started that, could imagine, and not the scientists, not the technicians, not the politicians, not even me, uh, could imagine how complex this uh, system is. And every day we discover new things uh, where we need solutions from. And that's, I think, one of the things you and other countries can profit from. We paid a lot of billion euros already to make experiences others don't have to make anymore. Could give you lots of examples for that. As I said, we wanted to engage people, and I'll just give you two short examples, which take one minute. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, one thing we started, first city actually in, in Europe who did that, uh, was so-called um, um, oh, again uh, was a solar radiation project. So we took laser scanner data of the whole city to find out which roofs are how good, how potentially good, uh, suitable for uh, photovoltaics. And so everybody could enter his address and see exactly. Um, what his roof, and uh, you see it on the next photo that's on the internet then. If it's red, it means it's perfect for uh, solar energy. You could exactly see how many kilowatts you can earn from this roof through a year, how much you would have to invest, and so on. And uh, about 45,000 people used the system. And uh, as I said, we were the first city in Europe who did that. Now every city in Germany from Hamburg to Berlin, they have all copied that. That's kind of standard. And it's a quite cost effective uh, thing like costing 50,000 euros, including the flight and the whole interpretation. Another project we did um, uh, last year was a thermographic aerial survey project. Again, uh, a plane flew in the winter time during the night across Osnabrück and took infrared pictures to find out uh, which roofs are poorly insulated. And again, people could then get on their picture, could, could, get, could get on their photo, okay, so, uh, on their address to find out if their uh, house is good or bad insulated or they, if they have a problem. And you can clearly see those blue houses uh, on top of the picture that are good insulated houses, while the one with uh, orange and red are bad insulated. And we want them then to get uh, advice for free, uh, what we offer, and in 12 months, 35,000 uh, citizens in Osnabrück used this system. Almost every uh, house owner went on this system to see, and more than 1,300 then came to get uh, advice, and then we advised them how they can retrofit their houses best. And that's another thing uh, crucial for the energy transition process to get houses better retrofitted to, so they consume less energy. So I think that's now six and a half minutes, so I'm, I can't tell more. <laughs> Ask you questions. Thank you for your attention.
That's great. <laughs> um, I know you could, you could speak for, I mean, the tremendous amount of knowledge that I know you have just at the top of your head. So, um, but would love to get some questions from, from the audience, and I have my, my own questions, so uh, let's, let's start that out. And just a reminder, um, if you want to go through Twitter, um, I see Kean's busily over there reading the feed, so hashtag RECities at Carbon Talks, and he'll pose a question on your behalf. So please. Sorry, very simple question, just has to do with the first slide which identifies you and the project. I wouldn't mind seeing that so I can take notes. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> Mine's a little tougher, but it'll be easy for you, I think. So you mentioned the financing system and you'd refer to the carbon tax system, which I'm assuming is a carbon tax directly related to the users that they pay, like, it, like the user pay system. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be for all processes where just just carbon is emitted. Uh, you, you would have to pay carbon tax on that. Okay. And in we don't have that in Germany, but they're discussing it. If, if it would be the better thing than the emission trade system. Oh, okay. And in terms of the, the working emissions trading system that you said is not working, um, is there a way that you could see that it could be an effective tool or are you more in favor of, of the other way of, of the direct carbon tax? It could work, but uh, it's politically difficult uh, to, to let it work now. So when the EU started that system about seven or eight years ago, uh, the big companies who needed most energy, they were asked how much certificates do you need for a status quo? And then they got them for free. And the idea was then every year uh, the EU takes a certain percentage away from the certificates. So that would be an incentive to invest in, into uh, efficiency technologies. And um, because now, later on, they found out that uh, the companies, when they declared how many certificates they, they needed for the status quo, they put a lot more on that than they really needed. So there are many too many certificates on the market, and so uh, there's no incentive uh, to, to, to invest because of the ETS uh, system into new technologies. So, because everybody saw this, uh, the EU last year took about a million certific certificates for five years from the market. So, hoping that the price goes up then there. But you can imagine that there's a lot of resistance from industry lobbies who, don't, who's, who are happy to have quite a lot of cheap certificates. So, that should have started in a, another way. But uh, now it's not that working doesn't give that incentives as it should be. Great. Um, just back here. Uh, fascinated by the um, images, the thermal images and the solar potential images. Um, I, I'm curious the alignment of um, outcomes, like regional government, city government, utility company, and, and the, you know, if they have rebates, who pays, are, is everyone on side with that type of approach? In, in Canada, we often we, we don't often have perfect alignment between different players that overlap with the energy systems. And I'm curious how that's, that's working for you. I got your question right. I mean, those projects, as I just very shortly explained, they were financed, one thing with solar radiation, 100% by the city, and the other one half-half by the city town works and, and the city. And... Um, so, um, actually, that wasn't much. We were not able to subsidize any investments then in solar cells, in, in solar panels, or in, um, in insulation of roofs. But uh, what we want to do is we want to give people uh, very precise information to decide whether it's profitable for them. So that's how it works. But we don't subsidize those. Did, did I answer your question, or? Yeah, I guess if you had recommendations as to if you, if, 
what if you were to accelerate progress, what would be needed between different players who overlap with the energy systems, um, mm. regulators, uh, owners of the electricity grid, different levels of government? Yeah. So I, I think um, they, they all work together in that field. So it's, it's a little bit different in every city. In one city, the town works runs the uh, the power system. Another one, it's the big one of the four big power companies. So, but they all uh, follow the same goal there. I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this. Uh, is there any uncertainty in your plans at this point, or or can you see um, a combination of technologies and changes? that if they were all implemented would actually let you achieve your goals? Well, actually, um, I didn't thank you for the question, so that helps me to bridge over this five minutes. <laughs> uh, so what we do in, in Osnabrück is we are one of 19 uh, municipalities and counties uh, in Germany um, who are funded by the uh, federal government to find out what has to be done that we can achieve the goals of 100% uh, renewables and 95% greenhouse gas reduction to 2050, what has to be done on all levels. So um, we did a lot of studies then to find out that, for example, to reach that, the retrofitting rate per, per year on existing houses has to be doubled or tripled to reach that. So today it's 1% of all houses uh, is the average in Germany is retrofitted every year. But to reach this 2050 goal, we would have to double or even better triple that. And uh, that's one of the recommendations. And now this uh, project, as I said, is run by 19 municipalities. And uh, we just, a few months ago, we, we were sitting there in Berlin with the uh, Federal Ministry for Environment and it was a two days workshop and all came together for, with their experiences and they made a catalog of about 300 measures the federal government has to undertake to, to reach that. And the federal government is very interested in that because they want to reach this goal. I, I think they are quite serious about that. But uh, there's so many details which have to be regulated otherwise it doesn't work. One thing, for example, electric mobility uh, the goal of the federal government is one million electrified cars in 2020 being registered. Now we have only 25,000. So a lot of things have to happen in four years that this might be reached. And they didn't give it up. So in two weeks ago, uh, the coalition in Berlin, they decided uh, in a night-long discussion that they will give to the, uh, to the citizens 1.2 billion euros the next four years to subsidize uh, if they buy electric cars. So you will get 4,000 euros if you buy an electric car. And they hope with that and the improvement in distances those uh, cars can run and 15,000 additional charging points in, this, in, in the country uh, that will help to reach this. And I doubt that a little bit that came too late, but uh, I, we are very sure and one of the pre uh, prerequisites that we can reach our goal is that uh, traffic will get mostly electric. Will be a problem with big trucks. There you might have biofuel uh, solution, but all the traffic can only um, minimize in its carbon emissions if it will be electric, and this electricity must come from renewables. Um, for the setting of these goals and some of the nat other national initiatives that Germany is undertaking, um, do you have any um, uh, insights in terms of what happened politically at a national, state, county, or a municipal level that uh, was important to make this happen? You mean why, why this process uh, went on like this in, in, in Germany? You know, getting glimpses to the difference between what's going on in Germany and what's going on in Canada, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, I think it has quite long tradition, and it's, it's interesting that I was asked that a lot of times already how, how come that started and that it got such a dynamics then in, in Germany. Actually, I think, um, if I'm thinking back, it has to do with the protests against nuclear power plants in the 80s. There was a big movement within the country, no new power plants, while they were under construction already. And out of this uh, movement, one of the reasons, uh, um, the Green Party then was uh, was founded. And in the first, the established parties they they didn't hear for the for the uh, questions or for the uh, demands the Green Party was asking for. And at that time, already in, at the end of uh, the 80s. Um, they were asking for renewable energy. At that time, nobody knew really the solar panels w w didn't exist, wind turbines didn't exist like today, but they wanted renewable energy. And when they went, entered parliaments then everywhere, uh, then uh, the existing parties got greener and greener by the time. So it was a like, kind of competition between, between very successful green party and the existing parties. And so if you see uh, the conservative party today, uh, that would be the greenest party in 1980. So uh, they all got much greener and that was, I think, one of the, one of the reasons why um, this process got so effective. The other thing is the Chernobyl um, thing that happened in uh, Ukraine in 1986. Um, meant that uh, th this potential risk of nuclear power hit Germany as well. And until t today, in southern Germany, wildlife, uh, certain wildlife may not be eaten because of radioactive contamination. A lot of uh, mushrooms in Bavaria you shall not eat. They can't be sold. And so there was something not happening, to, it happened 2,000 kilometers away but still it affected, and I think that made people think different, not only about nuclear power, but about other power systems. And I think then the Fukushima thing, that was the final thing to, to, to now we have to uh, really enforce all our, our uh, measures we do, all our things. Do you want it from Twitter or from James? Okay, uh, Dalef, there's two closely related questions from Twitter. One is, what would you recommend for BC municipalities? And the other is, what mechanisms for cooperation exist between city and hinterland in Germany for renewables deployment? First question, I think, I mean, you can't uh, compare situation in Germany with this in BC, as I said. You have here already about 97% of carbon-free power, but you don't have only power, but you have also heating, cooling, energy, and uh, so uh, I think retrofitting is also a problem here to get good rates. And for that, you on the one hand need a finance system, so I think the province, for example, should somehow finance uh, or give people funds, grants, uh, to do things on their houses if they want to reach goals like that. And uh, you have to get the people involved. And the two projects I showed you, um, that are projects which, with a little amount of money, uh, are quite inno innovative and uh, get people interested and you get in contact with the people to talk with them, to give them advice, what they can do with their houses and what they can do to uh, improve them. And the second question uh, about the uh, cooperation between uh, cities and the hinterland, well, I think there's a motivation for the hinterland to help the cities. It's just earning money. So um, we made a calculation for the county just beside Osnabrück, which will help us hopefully in the future. Uh, and they found out that today, every year, in this one county only, they pay one billion euro for energy going outside the county, which for electricity produced outside the county, 
for oil imported from Russia and from Saudi Arabia, for gas from Russia and all the things, and for petrol. Everything that's not produced in the county makes up 1 billion euros a year in just one county. And so if they, what they want, be self-sufficient in, in energy, then a lot of this added value stays in their county. So makes them richer. The, the profit is there than in the county. And if they sell energy to us because we can't install wind farms in, in, within the city, the money for that will stay in the county. So there's an economical drive to do that. Uh, I had a question about the Energy Vende, uh, because uh, I saw in the news coverage a week or two back that there was protests uh, in the streets of people that were concerned that the Energy Vende was going to be diluted uh, in some way, or some regulatory changes were in the works that, that they felt would, would undermine or would threaten the, the program's future. And I'm wondering if you could just detail that, or is, is there a move away from the feed-in tariff system that's been at the, the core of that policy, or maybe just bring us up to speed on... Yes. What those changes are about. Yes, that is. Um, um, of course, the whole things are much more complex, as I could uh, explain it in, in five minutes, or even six and a half. Um, <laughs> but um, and, mm, the principle is that uh, the government or this process wants to get away from feed-in tariffs. Feed-in tariffs were once created to, uh, to help a new industry to get into mass production and to, to, to make products much cheaper. And that was uh, quite successful. For example, 10 years ago when we started with this uh, solar panels, um, you got in the feed-in tariff somebody who, who um, put one kilowatt hour in the grid from solar panels, he got 48 cents. Now he gets 10 because uh, they got so much cheaper. And uh, something similar happened to wind turbines online, that's the cheapest renewable energy we have now. Yeah, it's declining too. They hope that will uh, work with offshore energy as well. So feed-in tariffs are used originally to, to, uh, to install a new technology. But uh, if you do that on the long run, you would always subsidize something. So they want to bring it to the market, and that's why they want to auction now uh, new projects. But yeah, so, to, so the, the one who offers a new wind farm for the cheapest price will get it. Of course, you have then very clearly look at this, uh, what is offered and what guarantees are there that it's built and so on. But uh, the protest you perhaps saw, it's coming from co-ops and from citizens because they are afraid for those big projects, they can't do the tender anymore. It's much too complicated, and the risk is much too high for all these studies you need. Uh, big, big companies can do that. So the compromise will hopefully be that small projects like b building one or two turbines, that will be still out of the auction system, so co-ops and citizens can do that. What is really important for the acceptance of the energy vendor. Today, about 70% of all renewables are in the hand of farmers, citizens, and co-ops. And the, the big four big power, plant, uh, power companies in Germany, until now, they only uh, own about 5% of all renewables because they always thought renewables will never de develop like this. Ten years ago, they always said, we, we don't believe they will ever have a quota more than 10%. Now they have 33 and the uh, goal for 2025 is 45% in the grid, and I'm sure they will reach that. So um, that's, I think, very important to, to get the acceptance. And just an example, if I would have seven and a half minutes, I would have explained um, that um, <clears throat> um, we had a, a wind turbine project in, in Osnabrück, three of the seven that exist there and they were in invested by the town works and the town works got the idea why don't we offer it to the citizen of Osnabrück the investment so if they think it's our, our own turbines they have an adi other attitude to it as if it's some company from somewhere who invested there 
And it took only one week to get the 10 million euros from more than 3,000 citizens who invested in that. And that's happening now in, in many cases. In, in other words, try to get the people part of the system. Yeah, just a question about the industrial users, like the, the copper refinery. Um, has the, the improvements mainly been directly within their facilities, or is there like some synergy with uh, the city and with other uh, users and residents around those industrial facilities? Well, actually, the uh, big facilities, they have specialists themselves, or they, they hire consultants to find out in which part of the process they can save money. And so it always has to do with if the, if the energy price goes up, then they have their plans already what they will do if the oil price or gas price is two or three cents higher. Then, then the, the payback point is, is a, a few years earlier, something like that. And so they decide, they decide that themselves, we can't help them. We are not specialists in their special processes. But there are hundreds of little companies, and they... They, they don't have the knowledge, and we advise them. And what we do is uh, try to bring together one company to the other uh, to, ex to exchange the experience. The same thing we do here with cities or provinces, uh, we do with companies or even citizens. One example, uh, last year, big supermarket chains started to, put, to install solar panels on their supermarkets because the, the power they then produce doesn't need any feed-in tariff. It's cheaper than buying it from the grid. So uh, when I found out that, I didn't know that. I just saw it at the end of the, of the year that we had one and a half megawatt more on roofs. And I thought, where, where is it coming from? It's a mistake. And then we found out there were big supermarkets. They didn't even tell us. And there were two or three million inst installed, euros installed on those supermarkets. I said, well, if they do it, other, other companies and other supermarkets can also do it. And when I come back now, we'll do a, a press media release telling uh, they do it. And everybody knows those supermarket chains, they calculate with every cent. And if they do it, they don't do it because they, they want to save the planet, but they, they want to save their budget. Under the uh, trade agreement, uh, some c corporations claim compensation for you shutting down the, uh, the nuclear power plants. Can you talk about that, what problems it is and what solution you found? Well, uh, there was a decision after Fukushima uh, that was done to close down uh, the nuclear power plants till 2022, and the last one will be shut down. And uh, of course, the power plant, the power companies who run those, and they are quite old, like 30, 40 years old. Um, they are they were paid off already, so they were very profitable because, uh, well, they were paid off, and every day they uh, made about one million euro profit from from each nuclear power plant. So, of course, their lawyers went uh, to court to suit the, the central government for this decision. But uh, until now, I don't know if all cases are decided now, until now, the uh, highest courts uh, said it's the right of the central government to decide that. So, uh, we hope that in the end we don't have to pay for that compensation. But the biggest problem will be how to demolish those uh, plants, and who pays for that. The big four power plants have a, a fund for that, for about 35 billion euros just for demolishing them. But the unsolved problem, I think not only in Germany, is where to leave all the highly con contaminated uh, building materials then. So there's no solution for that. Hey there. Um, I saw a headline this week um, from the EU that I can't remember if it was Norway or Sweden are planning to ban um, petrol and diesel cars by 2025. 
I just wondered what your perspective on that was and whether you think it's feasible and, yeah, how you see it playing out. I think German car industry doesn't like the decision. <laughs> But um, um, uh, Norway was that uh, who decided to get out of any combustion uh, uh, cars. And, but I don't know if they finally decided. It was in the government and it was in the newspapers everywhere in, in, in Germany and Europe. Um, but I think the, the uh, development is going in this direction. It might be then 2030 and there might be some... Uh, that doesn't cover all cars, but I think the direction is just what we also follow. We say the, the, the traffic will be electric in, in the future, otherwise it will be not possible to reach those 2050 goals. And I think in 10 years there might be battery systems which uh, last for much longer, there will be more fuel cell cars with, it doesn't have to be just on butter and battery. So I think that uh, sounds very revolutionary at the moment, but uh, in, in 10 years, uh, this will be something people will look very different on. And these car companies who don't see that now might be the losers in the, in the future. That was a perfect segue into my question. Thank you very much. Because my question actually relates to, as you have more and more people using electric cars, it's obviously great when you have a central source of power being renewables, but who pays for that power? Because your vehicle is, you know, it's, it's moving, right? So if I'm at home and I plug it into my house, will I pay for that power? So do you see in the future that potentially at, if you plug in at a shopping center that there'll be a meter where you pay yeah. If you plug in, it, what, what type of solutions do you yeah. see in the marketplace for that? So actually, what we are planning now um, in Osnabrück and in other cities is um, to run the public transport uh, electric or with plug-in hi uh, hybrids. And those cars, uh, we want to um, prevent... Uh, cars to come inside the city, not only because of carbon dioxide emissions, but, but because of uh, other emissions and because of noise. So we want to reduce that uh, radical. And a lot of discussion in Germany is now going about different mobility systems, especially for the cities. For example, our city, every day, and it seems for me if I look on TV here, the same 50,000 uh, people come by car into the city to work there. 20,000 go out to work there. And we want them on trains, on buses, and then we have mobility points outside the city, big parking spaces where you can leave either your electric bicycle or your car, your electric car, and uh, then install there also solar panels. So while the people are working then in the city, their car might be charged again. So, or if you go, um, go with the electric car to your company, it's charged there while you work. And the other thing uh, is that your battery can be a part of a storage system of power. So if you have not, not 25,000, it doesn't help, but if you have, uh, let's say, two or three million, which is a goal for uh, 2030 electric cars, then they can be part of the uh, of the storage system, which is another, I didn't mention that now, that's another big problem. Um, if you have more and more volatile energy in the system, um, you have days or hours where much more energy is produced than can be used anywhere. So either you shut down wind turbines and you just lose this energy, or you store it somehow. So, and so electric cars can be part of the system if there are enough of them. So this is a two-part question. I come from an accounting background, so I'm wondering if, if you have a balance, you can see a balance, where you actually have enough renewable energy at your disposal, given all of the, the plans and the technologies you can see, to actually meet the needs of your city. Mm -hmm. And the second part is, do you see a way that that could scale up to a city the size of Hamburg or Berlin? Well, we are absolutely sure with all technologies we can think of today, it won't be possible for a city uh, of the size of Osnabrück or even bigger in their city limits 
to produce uh, enough re renewable energy. The demand of a city and its industry is so high, so that can only be done in, in cooperation with the hinterland or, yeah. So that won't be possible. But for example, with the solar panels, we uh, found out for Osnabrück, if you only put on uh, those roofs who are uh, good or very good suited for uh, solar radiation and, and solar panels, we could cover more than 120% of the private demand of the whole city. So, and that we want to reach till 2030. And uh, I think as those solar panels always get more and more effective and even still a little bit cheaper and cheaper, um, then you don't need a feed-in tariff more. People will just install it. And so this will work, but you won't cover the industrial uh, demand of that. So this has to be done in cooperation with the hinterland. Just before you go, um, one of the other things that we got to talk about just before um, we came into the Carbon Talk was um, some of your engagement models uh, that you used. And one that stood out for me was that you were monitoring different neighborhoods in the city and would find certain neighborhoods that their energy efficiency was pretty poor. And you would actually sort of locate an office, a temporary office in that space, and actually offer information to those, those neighborhoods. Could you talk to that? inside the city yeah that's one uh, of the projects we do in Osnabrück um, that we analyze the whole city where are neighborhoods which are quite poorly retrofitted by now so especially neighborhoods built in the 50s for example at that time energy didn't cost at all anything at all so they were very poorly insulated and um, we get, again, funding from central government um, for projects that we then uh, uh, erect an office or we, we rent uh, office rooms there. And we pay then from this money a consultant who is there every day for a few hours, in the evening especially, so when the people are there, not when they work. And then they can go, come to him and get free advice of what they could best do with their houses and what that will cost and what are the best steps. Because people think we first change uh, our windows or something, like that, but perhaps the heating system would be much more cost effective. So, and this is done in, in, in oh, hundreds of projects like that in all over Germany and it's quite good because you have to get in contact with the people. This is a real problem that can't be under, underestimated because um, the people, after 20 years of information and information about climate change and what you can do, they sometimes think, uh, we can't stand it anymore, please leave, leave us alone with that. Although, uh, although they had a need to, to solve problems and to save money. So we always need interesting projects uh, to get them involved again. And they must be comfortable. So. It doesn't help if you say our office times are from 7 to, to 4 o'clock and uh, sorry if you don't, can't come, we can't come later on. Then you have to change your office times and have to visit them in the evening and give them personal advice. That helps and that creates a lot of money for investment as well. It creates jobs and on a municipal, municipal side. One last question. Hello? Um, I, okay, let me think about how to ask this. This goes back to a previous topic about um, alignment at a, not just a regional or, or countrywide level, but between countries. So um, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that France considers nuclear energy to be renewable and doesn't plan to abandon their nuclear program. How does that affect does it matter if one country has one view of renewable and another has a different view? And I'm thinking of the kind of relationship BC has with the rest of Canada as well as um, North America. Different states and different provinces have different approaches to energy. And does it affect the success, I guess, at a worldwide scale? Um, I don't think so. 
because the EU uh, they um, um, decided five or six years ago how much renewable energy has to be in the grid and nuclear power is not renewable energy although it's carbon free I mean in the end so if you uh, think about the processing of uranium that's perhaps something else but uh, the power plant itself doesn't emit almost no uh, carbon dioxide, that's for sure. But still, uh, until now, that was not, was not an option. So the only country in, in Europe which is building actually a uh, nuclear power plant is Finland. They are doing two. And those aren't finished since years. They are five years ahead and it's not, still not finished. And they cost already two or three times as much. So. Uh, the thing with nuclear power plants in Europe is at the moment that they are uh, not cost efficient. Nobody is investing in them. That's the reason why the British, they want to do one Hinkley Point. Uh, it's called, they, there they want to erect a big uh, nuclear power plant and uh, they can't find anybody to invest it, to produce it. So they, they are now hoping the Chinese will build their nuclear power plant there. And they asked the European Commission that they get a feed-in tariff for their nuclear power plant for 30 years, higher than for wind turbines. So there's a lot of protests now from the other uh, countries of the EU, which say that's not possible that you get for nuclear power uh, a feed-in tariff higher than for renewables. So they went to the highest European court for that, and well, we'll see how that works out. This is great, Detlef. I really want to thank you for coming and talking, well, now since 10 this morning, so we really appreciate that. We owe you more than water. <laughs> yeah, and you're not even done yet. Um, and thanks, Dr. Mishka Liska, Lisa, for bringing uh, Detlef here and to the Consul General and Vice Consul for, for joining us today. That was really great. Um, and to all of you for turning up. Um, I know where to find Detlef if you have more questions. And again, uh, so long as the YouTube streaming worked, it'll be on our Carbon Talks channel on, uh, on YouTube where all our, our Carbon Talks are stored online. And um, yeah, I want to once again just thank our sponsors, North Growth Foundation, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, and uh, SFU Center for Dialogue for allowing this to happen. Thanks, everybody.